So what is neurosurgery? You know, I think we always use it as the brain surgery expression, but what is it that we actually do? And neurosurgery is the study of the anatomy, physiology, and learning of the operative skills and the patient care skills to take care of patients that have anything wrong with their nervous system, be that the brain, the spinal cord, or any of the nerves. So uh, for those of you in the audience that are unfortunate enough to have yourself or a family member see a neurosurgeon, we do some serious things like brain tumors and aneurysms, and we really have a unique experience with patients because we form this bond, um, you know, because we operate on the thing that makes you you, uh, gives you the ability to walk and talk. So once we meet a patient, you know, we say we're married to them for life because, you know, this is such a bond between patient and doctor. Uh, we also take care of brain abnormalities that people are born with. Um, my specialty is functional neurosurgery, which is neurosurgery to restore the quality of life. So I take care of patients with Parkinson's disease and other degenerative disorders. Um, we also are spine surgeons, so if you have a herniated disc or arthritis, that's us. And we do carpal tunnel as well. So a little bit about Parkinson's disease. You know, I think it's been great that Michael J. Fox has brought so much attention to Parkinson's disease, and um, there's about one in nine people, once you hit your 80s, that are gonna develop signs of Parkinson's. This is a video of one of my patients, and you can see he has movement on the left hand, and he actually has Parkinson's on both sides. It's very common that it affects one side more than the other. And so he'd been on medication for years, and medication to the point of taking meds every two hours. And you know, this is really debilitating because you're unsure you know, how you're gonna be, so you stay at home. Um, it really affects your ability to work, to have a relationship. You fall into a carry caregiver role with your loved ones, and this can be quite awful. And uh, fortunately, I have the ability to perform deep brain stimulation, which is used when medication fails in order to treat symptoms and restore people's quality. Um, in fact, we can get people off about 50% of their medications in a lot of cases in well-selected patients. So here he's still tremoring. You're noting that left-hand side, and we're going to turn on the device, which controls both the right side and the left side. This is the neurologist I work with, Dr. Ramirez Zamora. And what you'll see is that we have taken him, who was unable to write a check or feed himself or drink um, or hug his wife, to somebody that has their tremor removed. So in order to do this, what we basically do is make a small opening in the skull about the size of a nickel, and we thread a piece of wire down into the skull about the size of a piece of spaghetti and connect that to a battery in the chest that looks very much like a pacemaker battery. Um, then we do a series of visits back and forth to program that electrical device and that pacemaker to give the right signals to give him tremor control. So this is the surgery, and what that frame is that looks like something you could build in your basement, but really is much more expensive than that, is a GPS for the brain, giving us the XYZ coordinates of the brain, and we can get within a millimeter of where we want to go just with that information. So here we're making the entry point for where we're going to drill that small hole in the skull. And then to get further accuracy than that one millimeter, because that's based on information from you know, a couple of patients from beforehand, what we next do is we actually listen to the individual neurons of the patient. So, and if you can hear that sound, we're moving the arm. We're looking at the brain activity. And every time we move the arm, you can hear a signal change. So you go one, two, three, you can hear that represent, and that's how we know we're in the right spot and that this device is gonna work for that patient. So neurosurgery is really cool and I love what I do and I'm eager to get more people to wanna do it um, because you really can make such a great difference in people's lives. So what does it take? Well, it's a lot of school. So, you know, you have to get your bachelor's degree. Um, during that time, you know, I served on an admissions committee and people always say, does it matter what school I go to or what my major is? 
no, you know, it, there, there has to be a way to separate people. So really you need to concentrate on your GPA and your medical admission, your MCAT scores. And then you look at things like extracurriculars or your relationship with your professors in terms of getting letters in, um, interviewing well uh, to help differentiate yourself. And then in medical school, medical school is four years, two years of books, two years on the floor. Spend the time in neurosurgery. People always say, if you like anything else, do that instead. It's a long road and you want to make sure you love it um, before you pursue it. Residency is seven years and you know you, you go from not knowing where the operating room is to basically being able to carry out an operation with minimal supervision at the end of residency. And then if you're still a glutton for punishment like I was, uh, another fellowship. So. Uh, and so I did my fellowship in functional neurosurgery. So residency, we've all seen ER and Gray's Anatomy, and it's not really like that. Um, so again, we show you where the OR is your first day. You don't have to figure this all out, and you may assist with you know, positioning the patient. And it's a, a series of graded responsibilities with feedback and with attendings present um, to let you know that you're doing the right or the wrong thing. And then once you master one step, you move on to the next step. So when I thought about not only the long road of neurosurgery, but also the intangibles that make the best neurosurgeons I know, I thought of five qualities. The first being dedication. Um, and you know, I think that again, to go through 28 years of school, to be there for your patients, um, like any physician is, but to have this bond, you need to be dedicated. It's not, it's not easy. Um, there are times when it's easier than others and you need to make sure that you work hard and keep that determination. You need to have skills, not only in the book world, but in the OR and then most especially at the bedside, again, because of the intimacy of this relationship. Probably the number one thing you need is resilience. You will fall and you need to get back up. And when you fall, you'll fall big because you can really hurt people um, by doing this. Not intentionally, but just sometimes things are, you know, don't work out. And you need, you need to be able to get back up on the horse and be resilient. And this is probably the secret to success in any field. And you need to be a leader. Uh, this is a team and you need to be the captain of the team. And surgeons don't in general have a problem remembering they're the captain. They have a problem remembering that they're part of a team. And that's absolutely <laughs> essential. That the you're involved with the nurses and the social workers and physical therapists and all the people to take care of the patient. And the patient is part of that team and the most important part. So what about women in neurosurgery? Um, so there were about 5% of all neurosurgeons are women. Um, we've come a long way. Uh, there were two in the 1960s. Um, when we started our women in neurosurgery organization, there were 23. And now we're up to about 280. Um, so we've made some progress. But when you talk about male-dominated fields and women getting involved in them, 15% is supposed to be the magic number. So we still have a long way to go. At 15%, it's when you stop seeing some of the biases and things are pretty neutral, and that's the kind of the magic number for diversity. So how do we do this? Well, first we have to attract people into neurosurgery, but we also have to keep them there. And um, we recently published a paper from our women in neurosurgery group showing that we have a hard time doing that. Um, women are much more apt to quit during residency. And then can you imagine not become boarded after 28 years of schooling? So what would drive somebody to this? And you know, I think there's, about, uh, there's three factors involved, fit, feedback, and future. So in terms of fit, I have been this person on the bottom row many times where you're the only woman in this group and everybody else seems to have a little bit more in common, at least on the surface, than you do. And that can be very uncomfortable when you don't feel like you fit in. Um, I think we've all had that moment when you don't feel like you fit in. And imagine day in, day out, working 80 hours a week, not fitting in. That can be grueling. And in fact, that's not just a problem in the Senate or in uh, surgical specialties, but that's also a problem at well diverse institutions like Harvard. So this is taken from Dr. Judith Singer, uh, who is the vice provost at Harvard. She published this in their annual report, 2013 and 14. You draw your attention to the bottom half of this slide, talking about, I feel that this is a good climate for women. 
and 43% are equal to male, their male colleagues. 43% of women said it wasn't equal. And in fact, 20% of men said it wasn't equal. So this is a problem throughout and one we need to be aware of. Feedback. By feedback, I mean not only giving feedback and receiving feedback, but also just generally the way we communicate. I mean, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Communication is a problem at home, it's a problem in the workplace, and people communicate differently. The Confidence Gap by Claire Shipman and Caddy K was published this year in The Atlantic. And what that looked at was how men and women view their own performance. So if I told you on this uh, tightrope, men and women walk the same same, they were equally as competent. But this is how the woman perceives that she did, where she was barely hanging on. And that's how the man perceives that he did when he was a peacock. And you know, men tend to over-evaluate their performance, while women tend to under-evaluate their performance. And there's a body of literature saying this. And one's not wrong, one's not right. Um, probably if we all met in the middle, uh, that would be the best thing. And you know, and that carries on. So in cases where things go wrong, women tend to say, oh gosh, that was because I didn't do something. And men tend to say, oh, that's because such and such happened and externalize that. And again, <coughs> no, neither is right or wrong. It's just a, a different perception. Men tend to excel in competitive environments. Women tend to like supportive environments that, where they develop relationships. And we need to be aware of those differences. And you know, this affects the way I educate my residents and my medical students. Um, I have this conversation with my female residents who outperform my male residents on some things where they feel like they're you know, hanging from that and they're doing you know, much better. So we need to be aware. And the future. The future of society and the future of women's issues is not just based on what women do at the workplace. This is based on the perception outside the workplace of men and women's roles. Until we all understand what I think is the most important job in the world, which is uh, raising our children and childcare and caring for our elderly family members and supporting our family and realizing that that is the most important thing and that men and women should share that task equally. Um, I don't think women can move forward in the workplace because they're burdened with doing this all by themselves. I love the sign. I took a picture of it. I was at the Weston Waterfront in Boston. First time I've ever seen this in a man's bathroom. So at least now we're giving men the tools to change things. <laughs> So, um, and again, they showed this at Harvard as well. So this isn't just you know our perception of what's going on. Again, from Judith Singer, and it, you look at the bottom graph on on the right hand side, and this is assistant and associate professor, MD, PhDs at Harvard, and these are people with working spouses. Men and women work the same number of hours at work, but then you go home, and women work 20 more hours a week. Until we change this and make this equal, women cannot, it, it's necessary for women to excel in the workplace and in the home. So what can we do now? I think we need to be cognizant of these fit, feedback, and future um, in the ways we change things. Women need to see people on the podium that look like them, that they can relate to and say, hey, she's doing this, so I can do this. In elementary school, when kids read biographies, they read six biographies about men as for every one on woman. They need to, that needs to be equitable. Young girls need to be motivated to know that they can do anything, including male-dominated fields. We need mentors and sponsors. Uh, this can't be understated. You need to have people that help you open the door to be at the table, uh, you know, as Sheryl Sandberg says, to lean in. And you also need those people not only to help you lean in and be present, but also to know what you bring to the table so that you can negotiate your position better. For instance, female doctors get sued far less than male doctors. So if I was a CEO of a hospital, I'd want to hire all female doctors. <laughs> but you know, we don't use that to negotiate um, uh, our skills, and we need to be aware of all of that. And organization. You know, I think women are their own worst enemy in terms of some of these organizations because you don't want to be in a feminist organization. But this isn't about feminism, and you know, I don't like that word. This is about being with people that you relate to, that you have things in common with, that are going through similar things in you that can help support and mentor you. We have such a paucity of um, 
neurosurgeons that are women, but also neurosurgeons that have risen through the ranks. We have not had any neurosurgeons lead our national organizations. We have one female chair of a neurosurgery department in the country out of 130 programs. We only have 10 neurosurgeons that have reached the full professor level. So we have a lot of work to go. And what we've actually done is we've coupled with the medical device industry because they're going through similar things. And so women in that field, we work a lot with medical devices. Um, and so we've been working together develop leadership programs and I've been fortunate enough to have mentors like Julie Foster who runs one of the Medtronic um, branches and Mona Patel at Boston who's a C-level employee to help mentor me. So we need to explore those opportunities. These are some of my mentors, and I just show this to make you think that mentors come in all shapes and sizes. Your mentors don't have to be um, they don't have to be women, and they can certainly be men, and they can be your age, they can be your friends. What you have to realize is that you're in a mentor-mentee relationship, and it has to be a comfortable environment where you feel comfortable receiving feedback. And they're going to tell you what they think, and you need to be able to hear that, and you need to be respectful of their time. Being a mentor is a lot of, uh, it's a lot of work. It's gut-wrenching to watch people, and you just need to really value that relationship and make sure you use this uh, to your fullest advantage. Um, I draw your attention to the upper right hand corner. That's Alexa Canada, who was lucky, I was lucky enough to train with. She was the first uh, African American female neurosurgeon, and she was tough as nails. Her job was to weed us out. And basically, and she was tougher on the women, but I will tell you, nobody messed with you if you passed her test. So, you know, that got rid of the gender issue from me from then on. So, to review, it's really important that we encourage. <laughs> young girls to go into the sciences and that we keep that up through the high school area and that we think about science different for girls. We want to be involved. It, it, women like to be in supportive environments, to work in a team. When we're constructing what science projects that we're working on, it doesn't have to be about building a car or a bridge. Make this something that women want to do too. And everyone needs a mentor. So I was fortunate enough last month to be the first person to implant this stimulation device in the country. But what's more notable than that is um, on the right-hand side of the screen is my resident, uh, Dr. Maria Perez Selda, who was the other surgeon in the room. So I would argue to say that this is probably the first medical device implanted by an all-female surgical neurosurgical team ever, maybe. And so that gave me great pride. And so as we're moving these issues forward, for women in male-dominated fields. Um, we need to work together as women, as men, as a society. And I end with this proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you.